I will say the words prostate cancer at some point. <laughs> I think you just did. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so I'm, I'm Connor, and I'm going to be talking about urolithiasis and the metabolic syndrome. The objectives of today's talk is that we're going to look at the definition and prevalence of the metabolic syndrome, examine the evidence linking stone formation to it, and review the workup for metabolic syndrome in stone formers. We'll start to look at the pathophysiology and the theories underlying uh, stone formation in the metabolic syndrome. And just a spoiler here, nobody really knows. Um, and we'll talk about current and future preventative measures for metabolic syndrome. So the whole idea for this talk came from the type of patient that we see in clinic all the time that I, I just think we, didn't, we don't really have a good answer for at this point. And this patient CP is representative of that type of patient. Uh, he's a 45-year-old male, and he initially presented to the emergency department, had flank pain, underwent a workup by the uh, emergency physician who found a, a stone on CT. We performed a ureteroscopy for a 6 millimeter uh, ureteral calculus because of intractable pain and elevated creatinine. And it went well, discharged home. Now he's being seen in clinic. He has contralateral calcifications. And on past medical history, this is his first big encounter with the, the medical system. He's followed by his GP, but nothing too unusual has come up on screening so far and has a uh, past medical history of an appendectomy. But with a little bit of probing, we discover that this patient is starting to become obese, mildly obese, has a fairly sedentary lifestyle, a moderate to high alcohol intake, and a not especially healthy diet. We know, we know this. We see these patients in clinic all the time, and we sort of have our, our spidey senses that down the road, this patient is going to develop diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. And this first presentation is, the, is sort of the sentinel stone of systemic poor health, the canary in the coal mine telling us that something is changing metabolically in this patient. And what's the relationship to this? What's the relationship to this development down the road of these other uh, features of metabolic syndrome? Is it just diet, exercise, and obesity? Uh, is it just a, a temporal correlation between these two uh, observations, or is there some kind of related underlying pathophysiology? So let's find out together. Um, stone disease, uh, uh, as a summary, is pre prevalent in the population over a lifetime of 13% in males and 7% in females. And this is likely a bit of an underestimate because this is based on data from the ICD coding. So it requires that, that uh, patients are appropriately coded with their uh, presentation. That gender disparity uh, is not hold for adults who are less than 50 years old in the United States with a nearly equal prevalence of nephrolithiasis. And this comes from a large study cohort, 17,000 patients. And we saw that only 49% were male. And it's widely theorized that this is because of changing lifestyles for younger women compared to older women. So what is metabolic syndrome? We talk about it a lot, but the, the formal definition we could review. Um, so it's this common occurrence of po uh, poor health, which is thought to be lifestyle related, and it compromises at least three of the following conditions, visceral obesity, high triglycerides, low HDL, high glucose, and hypertension. And as in all fields, there's some variation from the guidelines and the publishing bodies about what exactly uh, the cutoffs are for each one of these components and what the relative importance of all of them are. But from the urologist's perspective, this is what it is. And the relative risk for cardiovascular disease is two for patients who have at least three of these five conditions, which is really, um, uh, in addition to the quality of life changes that it causes, it, this is why it has an impact on uh, overall mortality or overall survival. According to the WHO, worldwide, one-third of adults who are over 20 are overweight, and that's defined as a BMI greater than 25 or obese, BMI greater than 30. Uh, metabolic syndrome is not thought of as a disease, but as a clustering of individual risk factors for disease. And the common underlying pathophysiology is thought to be this high caloric intake combined with a sedentary lifestyle. And this eventually leads to insulin resistance, hyperglycemia, and this hyperglycemia may lead to one of the theories that it leads to increased circulating free fatty acids, which are converted to triglycerides, and eventually lead to hypertension with atherosclerosis and inflammatory cytokines. One of the things that's, that's interesting about this is not all patients who are obese end up developing metabolic syndrome. And approximately one third of obese patients have fewer uh, circulating inflammatory cytokines. And along with that, less hypertension, glycemia, and dyslipidemia. And that suggests that some patients, for some reason, are able to uh, 
uh, have an adaptive obesity without the, the uh, responding inflammation, perhaps that's protective against the metabolic syndrome. Treatment in general is lifestyle changes, first and foremost, and then secondary, focusing on the individual components of the metabolic syndrome, be it dyslipidemia, hypertension, or diabetes, targeting the individual factors. So let's look at how that's uh, the evidence that, that links this to uh, stone formation. One of the big problems throughout uh, uh, the evidence that we'll look at is we're really unable to prove causation. We can really, we have some good observational studies for correlation, but it's very difficult to, to prove causation between these two factors. Um, one large observational study, 14,000 men and women over age 20 from 1988 to 1994, and the metabolic syndrome had a 33% prevalence in this population. 4.7% overall risk of kidney stone disease. And the odds ratio for patients who also had metabolic syndrome was 8.8% uh, with an odds ratio sorry, of 2.13 versus as, uh, less than that with no metabolic syndrome, showing a, a clear link between the two. And this was defined uh, as previously greater than three of the above risk factors. Like I said, a little bit of heterogene uh, heterogeneity to the metabolic syndrome definition, but I think it, uh, for our purposes, they were interchangeable among these studies. From the same study, stones were associated with gout, and 5% versus 1%, allopurinol and thiazide diuretics. Likely, the allopurinol and thiazide diuretics were really just markers for gout and hypertension, respectively, rather than being uh, causative for stones. This is a table comparing number of metabolic syndrome traits to stone disease incidence from this same study. Uh, on the left hand side, it's increasing number of metabolic traits from zero to five. And then there are three models that they use to look for uh, odds ratio for stone formation. The first column is the unadjusted odds ratio. Model number one was adjusting for age, sex, and race. And model number two, in addition to adjusting for age, sex, and race, also adjusted for uh, gout, thiazides, allopurinol, and lower socioeconomic status. Self-reported stone disease was 3% if there were no traits, uh, and up to 7.5% with three of the metabolic syndrome traits, and 9.8% with five metabolic syndrome traits. Across all of the models, two or more metabolic syndrome traits were uh, significantly associated with an increased odds ratio. And the range, as you can see, was uh, uh, with two um, in the unadjusted model going all the way up to 3.4, and then in the adjusted models, uh, 1.5 all the way up to 1.9. So again, we're seeing a very clear trend here. This is corroborated by another study, uh, another set of studies, the Nurses Health Studies 1 and 2. These are pretty famous studies in the stone, in the stone world. Uh, prospective cohort studies, the first one from 1976 and the second from 1989. Greater than 100,000 female nurses each, and these were administered a a questionnaire every two years looking at all kinds of different things, medical history, diet. Um, the, uh, the first study in Nurses Health Study 1 was uh, older nurses aged 30 to 55 uh, who were married nurses. That was one of their criteria for some reason, 97% white. In the Nurses Health Study 2, they did not have to be married, so the age is a little bit younger. <coughs> From these studies, we saw that obesity, weight gain, diabetes, and gallstones were all independent risk factors for kidney stones. And that weight gain was defined as a weight gain of 35 pounds or more since age 18. And those patients who had that significant amount of weight gain had a 70% higher risk of stone formation uh, in the Nurses Health Study 1 and an 82% higher risk of stone formation in the Nurses Health Study 2. Uh, diabetes had a higher um, uh, rate of stone formation of either 29% or 60% depending on the study. That's relative, uh, relative increase. And um, women with stones had a 24% higher chance of developing hypertension. Interestingly, in this study, which is different from some others that we'll look at, uh, the inverse was not true in that the stones did not, um, or sorry, the, that hypertension did not give you a risk of stones, although stones gave you a risk of hypertension. So it's, it's unclear why it worked one way. Yeah. That's, that's a good question. Um, so CKD in general, Although you can have an increased risk of stones, I don't think it, it, it explains exactly what's going on uh, in the metabolic syndrome alone. Like you can't, you can't just chalk this up completely to decreased EGFR. I think part of the reason for that um, might be that you still need to have a, a certain volume of filtration, but I don't know that we really know why. But it's certainly, I don't think that entirely explains the observations that we're seeing here with metabolic syndrome. Um, and again, uh, 
linking cardiovascular disease to metabolic syndrome, and in this case, stones, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, or sorry, coronary artery disease. Um, was this the nurses' health study one or two? Is this the younger? This is this is both. This is both. So that 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 obesity and weight gain. Uh, actually, all four of these were in both. These were these were risk factors that showed up in both, and um, fairly high relative increase. With the, with the end pains, that's the um, that's the males. Yes, but this so this is this slide is summarizing the nurses' health studies, yeah, but, but and then okay. this is this is the end pains. Yeah, and that, this includes men and women. That's men and women. Yes. And yeah. Yeah, and then there's another one that one you probably think of as a health professional's follow up. Because they, they do. If yeah. you look at the health professional studies, yeah. you know, that doesn't include a lot of doctors. It yeah. doesn't include a lot of dentists. Yeah. I don't know a lot of fat dentists. Yeah. I know a lot of fat doctors. You know, so it, it would be kind <laughs> of interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a selection they should be pretty good at dentists, so that's all I can able to do. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but it would be interesting to sort of see if there's anything that, that yeah. you can confirm has. Yeah. yeah, from health professional studies. That would, be, that would be very interesting to look at, and we'll get to it later. Um, just to hammer this point home, syst uh, systematic review, including six full text papers, really did show the same findings. These are papers that ranged in size from fairly small, 700 to over 100,000 patients, and the odds ratio for stone formation in the metabolic syndrome was significant in all of the studies, with a 1.34 odds ratio. Once again, having greater than three factors present from the metabolic syndrome conveyed a stone risk. A number of possible confounders in these studies exist. Uh, diet is the smoking gun. We talked about the underlying uh, pathophysiology for metabolic syndrome thought to be diet related. And we know that diet is a risk factor for stones. We see that there's a low calcium diet and a high oxalate diet from the nurse's health studies, uh, which can increase the risk of stone formation. And Obesity, of course, is a risk factor for stone formation. You might expect that the people who are obese have a less healthy diet in, what, in some way, shape, or form, uh, either with increased protein, potentially conveying an in increased purine load, or just a low calcium diet in conveying an increased stone risk. So these are things that we, we still do have to tease out. But with obesity, you know, like a salad dodger is not going to have a high, a high box. Agreed. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. But they may, but that may that may still be overcome by if they have a really low calcium, or if they're having just a huge, you know, a, a huge number of uh, meat intake per day, and and, and unhealthy um, increase in their, their or a very uh, uh, a huge acid load. So we want to know if these components of metabolic syndrome are independently associated with stone formation. Looking at dyslipidemia in stones, there was a retrospective uh, review of twenty five hundred stone patients in the U.S. And these are patients who had both a lipid profile and a 24-hour urine collection within three months. And I mean, that raised, the inclusion criteria themselves raise a number of problems with this study. It's probably patients who had a stone, because why else would they be having a 24-hour urine collection? And it's probably patients who we thought had uh, dyslipidemia, because why else are they getting the, the uh, you know, it could just be some screening that's going on, but at least we think they're at risk. That being said, uh, um, yeah, they did try to control a little bit by excluding patients who are on statins, allopurinol, potassium citrate, and thiazides. Mean age for the patients who were included in this study was 51. And uh, we saw that a high total cholesterol and triglycerides were associated with having uric acid specific stones. And we'll talk about the pathophysiology of that a little bit later. Obesity from the Nurses Health Study 1 and 2 and the famous health professional study uh, where there are a number of um, uh, male uh, Healthcare providers, including a large number of dentists, were followed for 46 years. There were 4,800 instant kidney stones. And we could see that obesity, greater than BMI greater than 30, was, had a hazard, hazard ratio of 1.33. And for women, greater than 30 had a hazard ratio ranging from 1.9 to 2.1, depending on which nurse's health study we were looking at. And there's another separate study that helped to back up this information that saw that very large men, men greater than 120 kilograms, excreted 37% more uric acid. That's the total amount of uric acid. And the thought might be that stone formation in the obese could take place from this increased metabolic load without a compensatory increased urine volume. We don't, these patients are not having a 37% greater urine volume, and that would increase their saturation of uric acid in the urine and uh, give them a propensity for stone formation. In terms of diabetes, uh, once again, these same three studies, Nurses Health Study 1 and 2, and for men, the Health Professional Study. Diabetics had an increased relative risk of stone prevalence on multivariate analysis, 
ranging from uh, 1.38 in the older women, uh, 1.67 in the younger women, and 1.31 in the men. And the ages for the, the younger, older, and the men were um, uh, 47% for the older, or sorry, age 47 for the older women, age 37 on average for the younger women, and age 58 on average for the men. So a couple of different age groups and sexes represented here. Um, and in this case, that association did seem to work both ways. So if you have diabetes, there was an increased relative risk of developing a stone, both for the older women and the younger women, but interestingly not for the, the men in this study. And then the increase and then the risk of developing diabetes, if there was a previous stone, was uh, 1.33 for the older women and increased also for the younger women and the men. Now, why exactly there wouldn't be a risk of developing a stone with diabetes in men? Sort of hard to explain. This is obviously a, a highly selected population of motivated health professionals. And the thought could be that um, with an average age of 58, maybe many of these men do have some underlying conditions that are undiagnosed. Or it could be that the patients who have diabetes are very health conscious and perhaps have a better diet than those who do not have diabetes. There's a number of, of different possible explanations for that. Looking now at hypertension, clear link as well. 13% of patients with high blood pressure had stones compared to 1% in normal tensors, according to this one study. And then in another study, 10% versus 8% uh, of a million patients, once again showing statistical significance. This last study was helped to show that, that link of um, hypertension after stone formation. So we saw that of stone formers, 17% developed hypertension down the road after eight years of follow-up versus 13% of patients who did not form stones. All of this, again, links back to overall health and cardiovascular disease. In the health professional study, we saw an increased risk of 15% of heart disease, 16% risk of uh, MI, risk of angina, risk of coronary bypass, all speaking towards our patient's general health. So this, together, really helps to hammer home the point that stones should be started. We're starting to look at stones as a systemic disease. Um, it's not just a disease of uh, electrolyte processing in the kidney, which is what it was once thought of. And there are all these different factors that, that are involved in the way that we shape, uh, that we create stones. Our diet, our microbiome processing of a diet, absorption, a complex interplay of uh, internal hormones. Uh, we don't still understand the role of atherosclerosis. And as Miles mentioned, how CKD ties into all of this. And this really speaks towards a multi-system approach for understanding uh, stones and understanding stone prevention. And it puts urologists in a, in a, in a unique position as we, we can start to see um, patients early on in this disease process. Like we said, the stones seem to be showing up in some patients earlier on and figuring out what changes are happening at the metabolic level in these patients that may affect the rest of the, the, the um, uh, organ systems is, uh, is a good spot to be. So what types of stones form in metabolic syndrome? Looking at 500 patients, a retrospective chart review was performed of patients who had stones of their stone type and um, what their metabolic syndrome factors were. So <coughs> surprising no one, the metabolic syndrome patients have a higher relative prevalence of uric acid stones. And meanwhile, a lower relative prevalence of calcium phosphate stones. And these are all relative prevalences. So calcium oxalate relative prevalence remained unchanged. But obviously their overall stone formation um, uh, risk was increased. So even though the, the calcium oxalate relative prevalence was unchanged, they still had a greater absolute number of calcium oxalate stones. This is represented graphically here. So on the y-axis of this chart is the relative frequency of stone type, and the x-axis is the number of metabolic syndrome factors ranging from 0 to 4. Um, overall, we can see a statistically significant increase in the relative frequency of uric acid stone formation. And that's oops, that is represented by these bars here. As we increase the number of metabolic syndrome risk factors, the uric acid relative prevalence increases as a trend. And then meanwhile, calcium phosphate, which as you know, precipitates at a higher pH, um, slowly, slowly decreases with number of metabolic syndrome factors while calcium oxalate stays the same. And once again, this is relative frequency. Uh, in this particular study, only hypertension and diabetes showed a statistically significant association with uric acid stone formation independently, and BMI was not independently associated with stone type, unless BMI is greater than 40. But uh, uh, in fairness to them, the metabolic syndrome definition does not normally rely on BMI. It's, it's 
Um, they look at waist circumference, and BMI is not necessarily the best surrogate for adipose tissue. So let's look at how we work up metabolic syndrome in stone formers. We've seen that uh, first or several times stone formers appear in clinic. We seem to be at risk for development of metabolic syndrome. And even with all these studies that we have, still causation versus correlation is, is up for debate. That being said, we know that preventing metabolic syndrome benefits overall patient health. And although we can't definitively say this, it may also prevent stone episodes. So is there a way to risk stratify or determine which patients should undergo workup for systemic disease? Guidelines are not particularly directive in this case. The AU guidelines mention diabetes and metabolic syndrome and obesity as risk factors for stones and recommend taking your focused uh, history and physical examination. But they make no mention of ordering steroid lipids or hemoglobin A1C. And you can debate whether or not that's the role of the urologist to perform, but you can contrast that with the erectile dysfunction guidelines, which recommend this as part of a urologist evaluation for a first time, uh, uh, someone who presents first time with erectile dysfunction. Um, the CUA guidelines also don't provide recommendations for metabolic syndrome workup. So let's look at what the, the family physicians are doing. Um, these are the guidelines for, for Canadian GPs for screening for, for diabetes and other things. Uh, for a patient who is greater than 65 years on the right here, they recommend a fasting lipid profile every one to five years and an A1C or fasting plasma glucose if at risk. And meanwhile, in the less than 64 year age group, um, fasting lipid profile uh, at over age 40 every one to five years, and an A1C if at risk. Now, we've established through the, the first part of this talk that, that certainly patients who form a stone are at increased risk for both of these, both of these uh, uh, diseases as well as hypertension. And so, you know, I, I, the urology clinic is extremely busy here. I don't know if we have the capacity to necessarily order hemoglobin A1C and fasting plasma glucose and, and, and a dyslipid, um, dyslipidemia panel on everyone. But I think at the least we should be communicating to the family physician that this patient is at increased risk for these diseases and we would recommend screening in accordance with the guidelines. And that might trigger, for example, a 39-year-old who's a stone former to have this type of a workup which they wouldn't otherwise have and get them on that road to prevention for metabolic syndrome and stones in the future. Hypertension screening is also something that we should be, I think, communicating to the family physicians. It's challenging in BC with many primary care providers uh, uh, not available for patients, but a regular hypertension screening would be part of this workup for uh, a stone former, especially if there's anything on history or physical that gives a bit of a sniff of metabolic syndrome down the road. Obesity resources, once again, primary care providers are experts at preventative medicine, uh, and there are stone-specific diets out there, but general obesity resources are available to patients as well through this BCH initiative called the Healthy Plate. And the basic premise here is that Half of a plate or a bowl should be vegetables and a quarter whole grains and meats or alternatives. And that's something that, that you can connect patients with their GPs to help with obesity management. I, like we were talking about, the stone space provides an area for researchers to look at the physiologic changes that might predict future metabolic syndrome. Given that we're seeing patients present with uh, uh, end organ <coughs> change, which is the formation of a stone, we might expect that they could have pathophysiologic changes uh, throughout the body in, in um, other organ systems and coming up with a biomarker that predicts who is going to develop metabolic syndrome down the road would be very beneficial for patients. <coughs> We're not there yet, but this particular study looked at a um, uh, ratio of different types of white blood cells pre and post PCNL and we were able to correlate that with metabolic syndrome. So these are Ratios, which I haven't seen before, but are apparently inflammatory markers used in other fields. Neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, platelet to lymphocyte ratio, and lymphocyte to monocyte ratio. The, these, uh, this paper performed a retrospective review of 500 nephrolithiasis patients versus 200 controls and looked at uh, these markers pre and post PCNL. They found, and they also looked at uh, the prevalence of metabolic syndrome. So there was an increased prevalence of metabolic syndrome in the stone forming group. And they found that these four markers, the neutrocyte to lymphocyte ratio, the derived neutrocyte to lymphocyte ratio, uh, lymphocyte to monocyte ratio, and uh, platelet to um, lymphocyte ratio was higher in lithiasis patients. Um, those were also higher in patients with metabolic syndrome. But the one that was higher in metabolic syndrome, but not the stone formers, was the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio, which was a potential predictor of metabolic syndrome. 
Now this is looking at patients with current metabolic syndrome as well as stone formation, but it is the first step towards trying to develop a test that could potentially predict the onset of metabolic syndrome. I'm not sure that this particular test will end up being the, the, the silver bullet, but uh, it does show that the research is moving in that direction to try to find biomarkers predictive of metabolic syndrome. Connor, one of the things is, you know, like, for example, patients I think, yeah, that, that's really interesting. Both the, I think the hemoglobin C is a fantastic idea um, for uh, making sure that patients are being picked up early for the uh, um, uh, diabetes. And yeah, I, I, in terms of the CT scan, that's very interesting to know. It seems like in stone formation specifically, we do end up having our, our sort of our toes in the, meta, in the medicine world because we're seeing so many patients who are picked up with something new. Uh, and just representing with a stone for the first time, which really should be driving our, our questions further and further upstream to figure out what's going on with these patients. So let's look at our, our leading theories of pathophysiology of urolithiasis and the metabolic syndrome. So we'll, let's start with a, a quick aside uh, of our refresh of how stones form in general. To make a stone, you need a high concentration of ion, and that can happen either through a high ion amount or a low volume of water. We can get that through a high blood concentration of ion through high intake, high absorption, or high mobilization from tissues such as bone or adipose tissue. And then we need to get that high concentration into the urine somehow through the renal handling of that serum ion. Um, we need to, to make a stone in a lack of stone inhibitors, and we need that to be at a pH at which the stone inhibitors are effective. And on the subject of pH abnormalities, that affects the solubility constant, which is that level that the concentration of ion has to exceed. Uh, into supersaturation in order to precipitate. And that can change with pH, and that, can all, that pH can also affect our ability of stone inhibitors, or as they're called, stone modulators, to work. Keeping the urine still, urinary stasis, such as UPJO, will also help stone formation. Uh, and there's some uh, talk about how the relative importance of a nucleus for stone formation, theories of... Uh, Microvascular disease such as basa recta having a, a calcification on which for a stone can form. Uh, other theories such as plugging up those collecting ducts, the ducts of Bellini, at which a stone can form. And then, of course, adding a foreign body, which through mechanisms of either biofilm or providing a nucleus can, can encourage stones to form, or adding an infection can, stone, can help stones form. I mean, I really think that stone disease represents a multitude of underlying pathophysiology. It doesn't, it's not really one pathway through which we get a stone. And uh, what we see is that, that end result, that calcification, but it can get there through many, many different ways. And trying to tease that out, especially in the metabolic syndrome, is difficult. That being said, we know that there's that association that we spoke about between metabolic syndrome traits and uric acid stones. So we saw of stone formers, 33% in this different study were uric acid stones compared to 6% in non-diabetics, and also that there were more uric acid stones in obese patients. So we know that more acidic urine results in the precipitation of uric acid stones. And the mechanism of this is thought to be related to insulin resistance in the renal tubule. This is the classic, um, classic teaching, that the renal tubule, through not entirely clear mechanisms as of yet, develops insulin resistance and decreases its ability to uh, create ammonia. The ammonium ion normally acts as a buffer in the urine to prevent the pH from getting too low. 
And without it, you get an increase in the free hydrogen ions in the tubular lumen, which decreases urine pH, and you get increased uric acid stone formation. And that increased uric acid stone formation is because of this, this pKa. So this is the solubility constant. And at uh, a, less than a pH of 5.5, <laughs> this uh, reaction here with the hydrogen ion uh, uh, binding to urate and creating uric acid will move to more towards the uric acid side. You get an increase in the concentration of uric acid, which exceeds its um, uh, saturation, and you get uric acid or uric acid calcium stones. What does insulin do promote? That's a good question. That's a, that's a very good question. But I don't, they don't have a very clear pathway figured out. There are some theories, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's not definitively proven. And um, it, uh, I think it's also not the, the whole picture. And the reason it's not the whole picture is because all of us walk around in a state of supersaturation all the time. Uh, all of us have our, our ions in the urine that are exceeding their, their KSP. And uh, we just seem to have stone modulation or fast enough urinary flow that prevents... Uh, stones to, to form. So I, I think that you know you, increasing the, the concentration is one thing, but you, there, I think I suspect that there's something else going on that the, the stone inhibition pathway is being overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not so much increased insulin. I know, but if yeah. you're, if you're not insulin resistant, what is it that insulin does to promote amino acids? I never. Yeah. It shifts from I, yeah, I think I think the metabolite theory is one of them. I think that there is there is also thought that it does act directly on the renal tubule, uh, and insulin as a signaler that then uh, when it's at very high levels, um, they develop some resistance. But I I'm not entirely clear on that, and I'm not sure that it's it's really elucidated out there either. But, but thank you for. Um, not to my knowledge. I don't. I yeah. Oh, you're telling me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to thank you for your external validation that I'm actually super sensual. Uh, I've always felt super sensual. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Doctor. Um, so we know that that we do we do observe this, you know, whatever the mechanism is through the renal tubule, which hopefully we'll get more and more data on. Um, we do observe it clinically in patients. So for patients without stones who have metabolic syndrome. A higher, BMA was, a, a higher BMI was linked with a decreased urine pH, and the degree of insulin resistance was the most predictive for the decrease in urine pH. That's represented graphically here. The y-axis is the multivariate adjusted 24-hour urine pH, and the x-axis is the increasing number of metabolic syndrome features, which decreases from roughly 6.2 down to 5.8 or lower, with a p-value which is statistically significant for that linear trend. So the more features you have of metabolic syndrome, the lower your urine pH is, especially with insulin resistance. One might theorize that diet alone could explain this finding, uh, with high protein causing a decrease in pH or increasing uh, purine load. And this study helps to question whether or not that's truly the case. So they took four groups of 20 patients, and the uh, stone formers and non-stone formers, and fed them a standardized diet for seven days. These were control patients, patients with uric acid stones, mixed stones, or calcium oxalate stone formers. A week of a standardized diet, they checked their urine pH at the end of the seven days, and then they provided them with an acid load with ammonium and uh, looked to see what their urine did after that. The results were even on the standardized, standardized diet, those patients with uric acid stones had a, a lower pH um, and less ammonium excretion. So that's consistent with the proposed mechanism from earlier that there's something intrinsic going on. Although one could argue that seven days is not long enough to uh, really standardize a diet. The urine also further acidified after the acid load in all patients, although less in the uric acid stone formers than the other groups. Although, you know, that's not entirely surprising given that 
Uh, for a given pH, you need a, a larger amount of acid to change it if it's already decreased from the mean. And the absolute pH still the <coughs> lowest in the uric acid stone forming group. This study also suggests that metabolic syndrome sensitizes the kidney to insults, which it might otherwise have been able to withstand. So this is a rat study. They took four groups of 10 rats, and they took they were control rats, stone-forming rats who were fed ethylene glycol to induce oxaluria. This is something they've done in animal model models before. Um, they created a metabolic syndrome in rats by feeding them fructose, and they did a combined group, which both had the metabolic syndrome and stones. I should say, first of all, that this has all the usual limitations of an animal model. Ethylene glycol is not how we get stones necessarily in humans. And the metabolic syndrome group for rats was established only by um, high triglyceride level. There was no weight gain and no blood glucose level. So it's not a perfect model. That being said, the results that they had were fairly interesting. Uh, these are four measures of renal function in the four groups. So that up here is uh, diuresis, the control group, the metabolic syndrome group, the stone forming group and the combined metabolic syndrome and stone forming group. And across all these four measures of renal function, there was decreased renal function in the combined metabolic syndrome and stone formation group. So increased diuresis, uh, increased creatinine, decreased creatinine clearance, and increased tubular damage. And that was statistically significant. And the reason for that is represented visually here. This is a histologic slide of what happened to the kidneys in those four groups. So the controls, metabolic syndrome, and stone forming kidney histology looks relatively similar. And here, there's significant crystallization all throughout the parenchyma of the kidney, generated in the metabolic syndrome and ethylene glycol fed rat group. Um, so this is suggesting that there's, that either the metabolic syndrome insult or the ethylene glycol insult on its own could be withstood and overcome. But combining those two, uh, for some reason, really precipitated crystallization. Uh, they tried to look at a cause for this. And there was a significant level of osteopontin mRNA levels in the combined group in tubular cells. It's thought by some to be a stone inhibitor. It's thought by others to be a, a marker of generalized uh, inflammation. Uh, it's hard to know if this is really something that's causing, um, uh, if, this is, if this, these increased levels are, are uh, really a, a, an attempt for the cell to inhibit crystallization or if it's just one of those markers that we happen to pick up. But it, and it's been around for a while. It hasn't, hasn't really been a strong target yet for anything, but it is interesting. This same finding, so that was a relatively small study, but the same finding was corroborated by another group independently. A similar type of model, slightly different though, was leptin deficient mice fed ethylene glycol and their metabolic syndrome was induced by a high fat diet rather than a high fru fructose diet. And once again, they saw those high renal crystal deposits in the combined mouse group with high fat and ethylene glycol. And they also found high osteopontin expression. There were a number of other general um, inflammatory markers, uh, uh, chemoattractive protein 1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha, which were all increased as well. So what are we doing right now to help prevent stone formation in these patients, and, and where are we moving in the future? Our current prevention, more water, and less meat and protein, and that, that's true for all types of meat. We know that uh, fish, uh, as well as beef and chicken, does increase your urinary acid, urinary uric acid. It can alter our ion intake, such as calcium and oxalate. And we have targeted pharmacology for 24-hour urine parameters, K-citrate, allopurinol. Um, as Kamora mentioned last week, there's no strong evidence for a specific targeted dietary intervention for 24-hour urine prevention um, rather than giving a generalized diet. But there's lots of room for improvement. The guidelines are consistent with that. That's what they're, that's what they're recommending. 2.5 liters of urine per day, decreasing sodium, moderate calcium, limit oxalate-rich foods, and increasing fruits and vegetables, pharmacology based on 24-hour urine input. And no, there are no specific metabolic syndrome recommendations as of yet. So what can we do to help prevent uh, stone formation in metabolic syndrome? One thing that's been looked at is statins. We're looking at, uh, this is, might theoretically working through that vascular hypothesis, uh, helping to prevent atherosclerotic <coughs> plaques eroding through and providing a nucleus in the renal papillae. It could also be working through another mechanism, which is just generally reducing uh, the circulating lipids that are causing inflammation, hypoxic anemia, uh, injury, ischemia, and fibrosis. Um, the confounder in all this is patients who are on statins could just be having the stone clinic effect in disguise. These could be patients who are uh, more health literate, who are having more interaction with the healthcare system, and who have the discipline to stay on a medication. It may also be patients who have the discipline to stay more on a diet. 
but there are a couple of reviews looking at statins and stone prevention. This is a uh, retrospective review of 57,000 military patients who had dyslipidemia and 1,900 had stones. The patients who were taking their statin had uh, less stone formation, that's 3.1% versus 3.7%. This is statistically significant. And that was uh, still uh, reduced on multivariate analysis after adjusting for comorbidities, age, and sex. But that's, I mean, it's really just people who are taking their medicine. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. 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 I hundred percent. I hundred percent agree. Yeah. I, I think that there's a, there are, there are huge factors, uh, conflict, uh, confounding factors for this study. Yeah. 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 And, and that's definitely what, what makes, um, creating chemo prevention for stones and, and for anything very difficult. Um, another study uh, showing statins, again, suffers from the same possible confounders. Uh, this is patients with a new diagnosis of hyperlipidemia, and those who were receiving a statin versus those who did not receive a statin um, uh, were more likely to have a decreased stone formation. The statin recipients, interestingly, were both older and had a higher BMI, but were still getting a decreased <coughs> rate of stone formation. So, you know, huge confounders here. These are all patients with a new diagnosis of dyslipidemia. We don't know why some were getting statins or not. Everyone had that new diagnosis compared to the last study where people had a previous diagnosis. But that is something that we observed statistically. Looking at uh, high glucose, this cross-sectional study looked at uh, a stone formation rate for patients and were able to correlate that with their A1C and fasting plasma glucose. So these were all patients, they took 2,000 patients who were having just a general health checkup, uh, did a number of measurements for them, including uh, diabetes markers, and everyone got an ultrasound. Interestingly, the incidental rate of stone in this particular patient population was 5.8% on ultrasound, which seemed a bit high for me, for people just walking in the door. Um, but we saw that there was a trend uh, compared to hemoglobin A1C less than 5.5, and going up to 6.5, the odds ratio was 1.98 for that high A1C. And that was also observed for high fasting plasma glucose. Causation is not answered here. These could just be patients with undiagnosed diabetes that we're picking up, but uh, it does add to that evidence. Um, coming back to the mechanism that we talked about with insulin, this retrospective review compared patients with type 2 diabetes on insulin versus oral antihyperglycemics and found that insulin therapy was associated with a higher urine pH compared to oral medication. And that's despite the fact that the insulin therapy patients had on average a higher hemoglobin A1C. Uh, and meanwhile, without looking at the difference between the insulin and the oral hyperglycemic, antihyperglycemic agents, hemoglobin A1C alone was inversely related with urine pH, so a higher hemoglobin A1C resulting in a lower urine pH. So that makes you, that, that helps to again add to that a uh, little bit more clinical evidence that the insulin is playing a role here for urine pH. What about weight loss? We know that the DASH diet reduces stone incidence. Uh, that's a diet with high fruits and vegetables, moderate, moderate to low dairy, and low protein. This would also be expected to aid with weight loss, and we know that weight gain from the Nurses' Health Study 1 and 2 is in, associated with increased stone uh, risk. That being said, going to extremes, uh, surgical extremes to um, uh, manage weight will result in an increased stone risk. We know that four years post rerun wide bypass, stone incidence increased uh, to 7.6% versus 4.6% in obese controls, probably because of the uh, uh, gut handling of uh, oxalate. So where can we move from here? There's a number of possible future targets for metabolic syndrome and stones. Uh, one group was finding that these um, SNAT3, PDG, and PEPCK mRNA proteins involved in ammoniogenesis are upregulated in uh, mice with uh, oral glucose intolerance. Um, TNF receptors, in a, in a similar study to the other ones that we looked at, um, where we found that oxalate deposition in the kidney, and they were able to decrease that oxalate deposition by getting rid of the TNF alpha receptor, which of course we can't do in humans, but might help us down the road with figuring out what the pathway is. Osteopontin still remains controversial as a marker or a target, and there are these brush border enzymes that may be uh, related to ammoniogenesis.
numerous, numerous unanswered questions in this. I undertook these grand rounds hoping that I'd come up with a nice clean answer for what was going on, and it's not there. We really still don't know what's going on with type 1 diabetes in stones, so there's really not that much out there. Uh, we don't know causation versus correlation definitively, and that's the, what suffers from these epidemiologic studies. They're very good for helping to develop theories, uh, but they remain that until we can really prove causation. We still don't know if we, if we fix glucose control, if we fix lipid control, if we fix blood pressure, we'll definitely be benefiting patient overall health. But there's not robust data out there proving that doing that will decrease stone formation risk. And a whole other area which I didn't touch on because it's too big by itself is the role of the gut microbiome and the metabolic syndrome. We know that the, it, for patients with metabolic syndrome, they're starting to do, uh, they, there's some evidence that a fecal transplant from a patient with better insulin tolerance will increase their insulin tolerance, which I wouldn't want personally, but maybe that will be the future. So let's go back to our case CP. The way we deal with them now is a negative workup for diabetes and dyslipidemia by the GP borderline oral glucose tolerance test. Patients interested in a metabolic workup, but we don't see any abnormality as happens so often. We provide a general stone prevention diet, imaging follow-up by GP, Patient is moderately compliant, becomes a lifelong stone former requiring intervention every five to 10 years, eventually develops metabolic syndrome, peripheral neuropathy, and has risk of sequelae. And we see this, this is something we see all the time. What we'd like to see in the future is that after the negative workup, we have a serum assay that identifies high risk for metabolic syndrome in this patient. Uh, and that helps to give us some impetus between the, you know, the dietary lifestyle and uh, uh, other current therapies which are available, which are initiated. Further monitoring shows a lack of success, and then we start to chemo prevention with statins or glycosides or whatever becomes uh, statistically significant and clinically relevant in this in the future. Um, unfortunately, we see continued progression of metabolic syndrome, and then we can move on to targeted therapy that modifies renal susceptibility to these abnormal urine parameters. And who knows what that would look like? Altering DNA methylation or gene expression and tinkering with the, the ion handling of the kidney itself. In conclusion, metabolic syndrome is, is prevalent, and we know that stones are correlated to metabolic syndrome as well as metabolic syndrome components. Uh, because of that correlation, we do have a low threshold for dyslipidemia, diabetes, and hypertension workup in first-time stone formers. I think we should be communicating that to GPs. And these first-time stone formers or early stone formers present a very interesting potential space for improved stone prevention. As we sort of see in prostate cancer that we're moving more and more towards the N0 space, in my mind, this is sort of, this is analogous to that. This is the patient who is having one, um, moving forward in the disease pathway and trying to intervene earlier and trying to figure out what biochemical changes are happening earlier and intervene at that point as opposed to waiting for end organ, end organ damage, which is essentially what the metabolic syndrome is right now. Thank you for the people who helped me. And um, we have some time for questions.